Okay, we'll start the uh, City of North St. Paul uh, City Council meeting for February 15th. Uh, if we could uh, uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everyone. Boy, this mic is loud. Wow. Uh, Jenny, if you take the roll. Here. 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 So moved. Second. Tort liability waiver uh, resolution approving acceptance of donations received January 2022 and building permit report for January of 2022. At this time, the council member would like to uh, remove one of the items. They can do so at this time. If not, a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved by, move, move by council member Peterson. Second. Second by council member Wong. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, the motion carries. Meeting open to the public. We got one, John Schmall, in regards to enterprise funds. Welcome, John. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, my favorite subject, uh, enterprise funds and the diversion of funds at the end of the year into the general fund. And uh, I uh, became aware of uh, thought uh, back in December when you had the uh, representatives from the, the uh, religious community uh, be here to give out cards uh, to help out individuals that might be hurting during the Christmas season. Uh, at that point, I went, uh, churches, uh, schools, uh, they pay uh, for their electric bills, they pay for the water bills, they pay for all these enterprise funds, uh, an amount of money that a portion of uh, gets diverted into the general fund. And I don't know if they've ever been asked if that was a good thing to do, but they, in a way, they're paying a lot more than I pay at this diversion of these funds into the general fund. But if they've ever been asked as to whether they like that happening, uh, it, and back in five, six years ago, we were diverting up to a million dollars just out of the electric fund into the general fund. So uh, it's kind of akin to what Mayor Coleman did in St. Paul. He, they uh, started breaking down uh, special charges for street uh, sweeping, uh, for anything that was uh, normally covered by taxes. And uh, the churches took that to court, went all the way to the Minnesota Supreme Court, and, they, and the ruling was that you couldn't do that. If you're going to charge nonprofits, religious organizations, uh, for services, anything that comes out of the general fund, you would have to break them down specifically and say, this is the charge. They used to. Uh, the first off, they just said you had so many front foot of property Here's the charge per front foot for all the things we do. Then the court said you can't do that. You have to say these are the charges and this is the charge per whatever we're doing. I saw that on my uh, mother's, uh, uh, or the homestead that my brother lives in by seeing the St. Paul uh, tax forms and they were really strange. They went up, they went down, whatever. But anyway, they, I believe that 
when you charge these organizations for the electric, for the water, for whatever, and at the end of the year, you divert part of that money that they've paid in into the general fund, you are in a way kind of taxing them in, a, uh, in order to provide money from the general fund. So when you make that contribution in Sunday in church, part of that, at the end of the year, when they divert these funds out of the enterprise funds into the general funds, you're charging the nonprofits. So think about that for a minute. Thank you, John. Uh, anybody on Zoom? If not, uh, city business and action items, and I'll turn it over to uh, Acting City Manager Brian Frandel. Thank you, Mayor. We don't have anything under the city business action items, but if you don't mind, we can move into reports for the city manager and department. So I'm going to give you just a quick electric department update. Is your mic on? Is it? it doesn't. Not too close enough? How's that? Better. All right. So just kind of give an update. Um, uh, back in 2021, we, we started a new uh, overhead underground rewire up uh, so it been east of McKnight and south of Beam, kind of on the Indian Way, um, Chippewa area. Uh, we put in probably close to a couple miles of conduit up there. We've got some of the wire pulled in, but um, not all of it yet. Um, like any business out there today, we're having a really difficult time getting stuff into stock. And we've seen prices go up considerably on a lot of the stock that's out there. Um, one of them is even the meters for um, the Sentinel building. I still don't even have all of them in, or the meters for um, the Anchor Drive apartments either. And those were ordered back in February of last year. So um, pushing a year on them now. So it gets, gets kind of difficult. So we have a few things that we're waiting on for material uh, for finishing that underground job. Um, and just uh, to let you know, all the M&I housing over there, all those units have their power now, so we're complete with that. Um, on the Anchor North side, um, everybody has uh, their power, except for, like I said, the apartment complex, we're still waiting on um, the meters for that. <clears throat> um, this year, we are due for our five-year maintenance cycle uh, for testing, calibrating, and just general maintenance on our power transformer. That one transformer feeds our entire system. So that's kind of a big one. We'll, we'll switch over and we'll get fed off of XL Energy while we do that. We should be able to get that done probably in a day, if not a day and a half at most. Um, but they'll check the transformer and relays and reclosers and just do some general maintenance. Um, we'll get that going before the summer heat gets cranked up and our loads go up that much higher. So I'd like having that done before then. Um, just an update on our electric department employees. We have two apprentices now, uh, Cole Tanner and Lucas Newman. They're both doing well. They're both uh, training with their apprenticeship training programs and the books that they have. Uh, Cole came with us uh, with some experience behind him, so he, he was started off as a second year apprentice. And uh, Lucas, who's new to the field, is uh, working in his free first year apprenticeship. And they've been taking their tests and doing well, so it's going, it's going well. Um, and as I usually say every time we talk about this, but uh, the city is just very fortunate to have such a dedicated, talented group of guys that we have for the linemen taking care of our system, and them taking pride in the system and just being proactive in anything they see out on the system. So they're really doing well. Um, right now we're doing well in the wintertime, like we always do, we like to focus a lot on tree trimming that just pays off so well when it comes to the summer storms and branches coming down and ripping wires down. So we continue away at that, but we're also doing system inspection and just finding things that uh, before they become major problems. So we're doing a lot of pole change outs right now as well. So, but things are going very good overall and uh, it's good to be back to the department. <laughs> Any questions for Brian? If not, I do have one uh, and this is off the topic of all the advertisements I'm seeing right now is for electric vehicles. I'm assuming that as we get further down the line in the next few years, I think that's all we're going to be seeing is electrical vehicles. Are we preparing for that, for households to have 
electric vehicles and how does that work? Are, are there private companies out there now that are going to be, you know, installing these stations in their home or garage? I don't know how that works. I guess that's something that, you know, five years down the line, we're going to have a lot more electric use for our city. How are we preparing for that? That is a large concern that we've been planning for for a while now as well. Um, even with the downtown project, I put in a duct line down there um, just in case, you know, every one of those parking stalls eventually needs a plug-in for an electric vehicle. You know, we have major companies out there like Ford saying by 2030 they uh, are only going to be making electric vehicles. They won't be making combustion engines anymore. Um, so when it comes to a home right now, uh, there's different ways to do it. A lot of people are just plugging into the regular outlet. That's a, a longer charge. takes a good eight hours to fully charge um, your vehicle at that point. If you want to go to a 240 system, you can um, do it in probably three hours. So we have some of the, just a couple of the cities in our um, um, power agency that they have specific programs for that. So how you would do it is if somebody wanted to wire up um, a service that would just be used for that electricity so where you could time it. So we pay less for electricity in the middle of the night as opposed to during the day. So we could set up a time of use system for that. Um, I have had two to three inquiries over it the last probably four years. Um, I said we don't have it, but we're working on it, and it's, it's coming. Um, and then that way they would just be charged for just that. So if they use it during um, the off-peak times, they would get cheaper power, but then the other side of that is if they use it during the day, then it's actually higher than what the normal resident would pay for that. That's the whole idea of a time of use program for that. Um, but it, what it takes is you have to have um, a larger wire to be able to handle those loads going through your neighborhoods. So we've already started that. We've done that in a couple areas, um, like going through Gerald there between Gerald and McKnight. We went through there and we upsized the, the wire going from pole to pole to be able to handle, handle larger loads. Um, we're just keeping that in mind as we move forward with all of the projects that we do because, yeah, it's coming. Um, I just read today that the, um, I think this was a Biden program, he was going to put $5 billion towards um, the electrical infrastructure of the United States. A lot of it's going to be going to states, so they will do it along interstates to make that, but there will also be some money for smaller projects, so I'm hoping that there will be grants and things available. We will be stalling one more um, in the parking lot, uh, on 6th Street there, uh, with the option to get another one if we want that. I um, haven't fully decided on that yet, but at least the option would be if we wanted to put one in later, it's right there. I mean, it's, it would be easy enough to do. So when we redo that parking lot, there will be one there that have a dual feed for two cars. But yeah, we're going to have to pick up the pace here in a very short period of time. It's concerning. It, it's it's going to be a big change. So what? Uh, so the demand for power will be substantially increased, I'm assuming. Potentially, yeah. And so part of that we'll be able to absorb because at night, that's when the load is really low. So and if they time that to where that's when they're charging, we'll be able to absorb a lot of that before you have to worry about upgrading the size of your wires going to the homes and things like that. But um, yeah, it, we have to think about it anytime we're doing any projects. So our hot, you know, summer days when it's 105 degrees and all the air conditioning is running and people are plugging in their cars, the demand yeah. will just, I, is our system able to handle that increase of load? The nice thing is when they, um, when we got away from Excel and um, buying power from them and we put our own sub in in 92, we upsize the size of the transformer for a larger load. Um, we have good amp capacity on the four feeders that we have. So that there was a forward thinking when they engineered that and designed that. So that's encouraging. You know, the rest of it we can do a little by little as we see them come online through like pole to pole. We can rerun wire if it's a smaller wire or wire going directly to the home. I can see your job getting a little bit complicated in the next few years. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Maybe not so complicated, but interesting. Definitely. Hmm. Councilmember Thorson. Quick follow-up here. If you're talking about electricity and plugging in cars, 
don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm assuming you know where does our electricity come from, the different sources of electricity? And just if we kind of have a short meeting, just maybe touch on that a bit so people understand. So we don't get anything from Excel. <clears throat> the only thing we use Excel for is their use, uh, pay them for their transmission lines to get the power here. Um, but uh, the market doesn't really uh, allow long contracts anymore just because the volatility of gas and fuel for making power. We don't have any energy that comes from coal anymore. Um, it's either gas or renewables. Right now, currently, per Minnesota state law, 20% of the power that we sell to our customers has to come from renewables. So we have a lot of uh, smaller contracts. You might have a three-year contract. You know, we can get them from Manitoba. We can get them from, um, we have a generating plant down in Faribault that has 250 megawatts. Um, 250 million, excuse me, megawatts. Um, so they come from different sources. Some of them are actually bought the same day for looking for day ahead, following the market to see if you can kind of save money here and there, um, depending on loads. I mean, it, there's a lot of calculation that go into that, whether it's going to be windy so you can pick up off your wind generators to be able to supply a town. Um, so it's a combination of a lot of different things. It's not just a contract coming from a specific generation station. Um, there are a lot of smaller contracts, and um, that's why we have the power agency that we do for taking care of that. So is there kind of a rough breakdown of like 20, you know, 20% 20 comes from solar and, and wind? Is that where that 20% is? And then what's the rest 80%? Where is that coming from? Is it natural gas, gas for the most part? Natural gas, okay. Correct, yep, yep. And is that what they do at the Faribault plant? Natural gas, yep. And we have the <clears throat> ability to do uh, fuel oil as well um, in a scenario to where maybe gas markets aren't, can't get us the gas that we need, then we have the ability to switch over, you know, I mean, which was valuable for some of the plants down in Texas when they had that freeze up. Um, they didn't have the natural gas supplies, and that's why they saw those brownouts and blackouts, but some of them were able to run off of fuel oil, so it's kind of a backup. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting. Uh, anybody else? You got your order in for the new electric Silverado? Ooh, not yet. I, I want to go drive it, though. Have you? <laughs> hey. Planning on you coming over and powering my house when the power goes off, so. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> can you speak to maybe the um, how many residents are signed up for renewables? Because I see that you can, you know, purchase one, two, three dollars worth of you know, renewables, how is that program going? Not too bad, uh, pretty good overall. For overall, we kind of look at it at a wholesale level for all the different cities involved. And in actuality, when you go by percentage, there's only one city that does more than we do. Otherwise, we, of, out of all the agency, or all the cities, sell the second most. Um, so we're doing rather well, I believe it's um, say four or five, four percent maybe, I think. Yeah, it's small, but still, um, you know, when you talk to people, if they want to put in some kind of renewable resource, more than likely a solar, you know, we can talk to them that, you know, you can get a 100% renewable resource power for $3 a month on top of your bill. So, I mean, pe some people will look at that as opposed to, you know, spending over $10,000 on a system if that's what's important to them. Thank you. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Kind of boring during the day, electric? I mean, just... <laughs> uh, anything else on, uh, I guess, reports of city manager? No, sir. That's it. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, reports of council and commissions and committees. Council Member Cole. Uh, Silver Lake Improvement Association had their annual meeting on Monday the 7th. Um, uh, we had a phenomenally, phenomenally fulfilling meeting, very long. Uh, Big shout out to Carrie for uh, not only helping uh, helping the SLIA get set up and started with Zoom, but being a very active uh, active member as well. And uh, she walked out of there with a couple of follow ups, or was it a couple of pages of follow ups? <laughs> so thank you again so very very much. Uh, SLIA is looking for two volunteers uh, to serve three year terms. So if anyone. Uh, is on the lake and interested, or I don't even believe you have to be, I don't believe the bylaws state you have to be on the lake, but are interested in Silver Lake and would like to be, uh, like to be involved, they, they are looking for two volunteers to, to serve three-year terms. Uh, it's also easy to become a member. 
uh, for SLA, go to www.silverlakensp.com. Uh, it is a $25 annual fee, a minimum. Uh, they are a 5013C, so you can, you can donate up to uh, as much as you would like above the $25 for membership. Uh, and membership is open to anyone. Um, EDA had a meeting on 2-8, um, uh, very good, very productive meeting. Um, the Economic Development Authority uh, has a letter of intent to purchase uh, the building located at 2515 and 2517 7th. Uh, the letter of intent, we worked through the fine print and the, the last details and I believe we'll be moving uh, to a purchase agreement uh, to be submitted um, I believe before our next meeting, based on the vote that we had. So, Terry, do you have anything different? Well, we're also looking at setting up a meeting with the uh, EDA, the Planning Commission, and the uh, City Council yep. to go over uh, a couple different uh, contractors that are looking at looking at that property. Yep, there's two de two developers that are that have actively sought after, you know, insight. So. Uh, Park and Rec is having their next meeting next Wednesday night, February 23rd at 6.30 here at City Hall. Uh, I haven't seen the final agenda yet, but I'm sure the approval of the Park and Rec Improvement Plan uh, should be front and center of, of that. They've been working on that for what feels like well over a year. So uh, I know they're excited to get it done and get it put to bed uh, and get it in front of council at an upcoming workshop. Uh, and that's it. Okay, Councilmember Wong. Yeah, so the Arts and Culture Commission met on February 3rd. Um, we kind of brought up the discussion of, of the craft wagon and the logistics around that. The, um, I think the Arts and Culture Commission is really looking forward to reviving that and perhaps partnering with the parks, um, especially in the summer months, um, on, on some activities. Um, they're still developing a process of accepting projects. They're also discussing what the financial obligation would be on part of the city, or if we're working with private business, what does that look like? So we're just kind of figuring that out right now. Um, I think that's all I have for the Arts and Culture Commission besides their next meeting will be March 2nd at 6.30. Um, the Planning Commission uh, met on February 4th. Um, there are new roles. Um, Elaine Barton and John Mongi will co-chair. So they'll alternate um, meetings and um, that's, that's what was decided on. Um, they're still working on the sign ordinance. Um, and then we also discussed uh, preliminary plat and variances, but um, I think that it was overall denied, and so um, we'll see where that ends up um, down the road. Um, part of the concerns um, from residents, there are a few residents that came out, um, but they were talking about flooding um, towards the end of their street and how the plat will be divided might um, increase um, impermeable spaces. So there was some concern around that. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that's it. Um, the next meeting for the Planning Commission is March 3rd at 6.30 p.m. I think we probably set a record. I, we almost went to 10 o'clock, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I feel bad for Lisa Ritchie. <laughs> She was, she was, she hung on there. Good. Thank you. Councilmember Peterson. Yeah, I attended the League of Minnesota Cities Advanced Leadership uh, last week. It was a good conference as usual. They talked on civility, media, and crisis avoidance, and uh, some good, good panelists. A 19th Avenue student-built house is progressing very well. The basement will be poured on Friday, so I will let the neighbors know because it will be, it's going to be loud. So I'll make sure that gets out. Uh, it's um, they could get the windows in there, but there's a delay. But it's it's going good. Business Association. We had a very good speaker, Robert Dew, and he talked about the EDA and what 
the expectations are, and it was it was a very well attended meeting. And I think next month is going to be uh, your manager John Stark, I believe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess yeah, that's all I have. Good, and I know uh, you being the council liaison for the uh, student built home, yes. that uh, it's a good idea to. I'm glad you're on that to yeah. talk to the neighbors because yeah, any disruption I, of I, noise I and. Know. You know, cold weather hasn't been very good to them, but it, we're getting good. Um, they're getting it. They're getting it done. It, they actually have a front door on there now, so it's oh, good. a good start. Good, Councilman Rathorson. I have nothing. Uh, general business. Well, actually, I do have. I do have a couple things. Uh, did attend the Highway 120 uh, public open house, and I believe John Schmall was there. I think I saw you on that Zoom. Uh, so they. Uh, they had a, an update on the uh, on the Highway 120 from 94 to uh, 694. They talked about the planning uh, and environmental linkages, uh, it's called the PEL. So they're looking at uh, from that corridor. There's four different sections in that corridor that they looked at. Uh, it's kind of interesting. They they said uh, access points. There's 489 access points in that corridor. What they like to see is 88. So there's a lot of access points. So they talk about safety in regards to this, to the uh, to the roadway. Uh, MnDOT talked, and it's not even on their radar for the for the next 10 10 years. Uh, uh, so four different sections. Uh, Highway 36. It's called. Uh, Highway 36 and 120 is called a spot location. So that's kind of its own entity. And uh, from that, there's been other meetings with uh, kind of higher level meetings with uh, city council members from Oakdale, uh, mayor from Oakdale, uh, actually the mayor from Oakdale, not the city council members, the mayor of Oakdale. and. Uh, uh, county commissioners from Washington County and Ramsey County, and then state legislators uh, really moving forward on regards to that spot location, which is 36 and 120. So look, that, that is still moving forward. Uh, I did have a meeting with the uh, League of uh, Minnesota Mayors uh, this last week, and they had a couple of guest speakers. Uh, one was talking about the workforce, uh, what's happening right now within within our state and with everywhere uh, within the country of why the workforce is, and it's, I could probably talk for an hour in regards to why, why that's happening. Uh, also had a meeting with uh, John Choi today, our, our county uh, attorney, and we're talking about the juvenile crime in our, in our area in regards to uh, car theft. So uh, he is meeting with the local uh, sheriff and our local uh, police chiefs, and there's also mayors and council members on, on, that, uh, on that call. And he's really listening, and he really wants to uh, come up with a plan, collaborative plan with all of us in regards to the juvenile delinquents and how they're they're repeat offenders, and how do you get them off the street, and how do you try to educate them? You can't do that when you're 14 and 15 years old. So uh, that is still moving forward. Uh, from that uh, general business, Council Member Cole. Uh, I only have one topic. Uh, March 1st, 10.30 a.m., there'll be a Zoom meeting uh, for basically the Casey Lake wrap-up. It's all the work that Carrie's put into uh, working with the multi-governmental agencies in the water quality and the aesthetic quality of Casey Lake, along with uh, working with the residents and the homeowners either on the lake or around the area. 
Uh, that will be via Zoom. I don't believe it's on the website yet, so keep your eyes posted, and I'm sure there'll be a, a big spot for it when, it when it pops out, so it'll be definitely visible um, on the website as well, but keep your eye open to that. That's it for me. Council Member Wong. I don't think I have anything, thank you. Council Member Peterson. I don't have anything, Your Honor. Council Member Thorson. Yeah, nothing. And I think I have just one, and that is the joint workshop that we just talked about in regards to the uh, property, the Lilly property, and that is March 8th. And I believe everyone got a notice, the council got a notice for that, and we'll have members from the Planning Commission and also the EDA at that meeting, and that will be on uh, March 8th. And I don't think a time has been determined yet. Okay. Uh, I, the email did come out, and I did not see a, a time. So uh, with that, uh, I don't think we have anything else. So motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Council Member Cole. Second. Second by Council Member Peterson. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you. Oh, 31 minutes. And you're